stop me and ask me questions if I go, because some of this is kind of new to some people probably. A little different slant than cross-clamping aortas and that kind of stuff, but still kind of fun in its own way. <laughs> Toxicology is near and dear to my heart. When, just like trauma, you enjoy days that are the craziest days. I mean, you like to see new stuff, you like to see wild stuff. We wouldn't be in this if we didn't otherwise want to do that. So a lot of the stuff that I see is kind of wild. If I have somebody who the paramedics bring in and say he's doing martial arts in the back of the ambulance, that's a good day. That's a good day for me. And they bring this guy in and he's got lots of toxicology sorts of features of my patients. He's got large tattoos. You guys see a lot of tattoos too. I don't want to offend anybody with tattoos, but he's got weird facial hair stuff going on. And as we watched him, he kind of started to perform for us. Now, if I told you he's under the influence of some drug of abuse in San Diego County doing weird stuff, greater than 50% of the time, what would you guess? methamphetamine. We all know what these people take. So he comes in and the nursing staff in the ED is very nice and they, it's a team approach and we're all trying to figure out. We later found out maybe there's some military background going on here. But as I went and started to type a note, he jumps off the front of the stretcher like Frankenstein with his hands above his head and he walks straight toward the secretary's desk and he collapses across the secretary's desk, blood's being cleaned up, paramedics thrown in the white towel, and he just collapses back on the floor. Classic day in the emergency department down at Hillcrest. You either like this, or some of the residents come down and the very first hour they say, I don't ever want to come down here again. <laughs> but that's toxicology, and you just don't know what to expect. I just want to give you the basics, first of all, about what we do down there when these unknown mental status patients come in with overdoses and poisonings and where we start with that. And then I want to touch on some of the newer drugs of abuse that we're seeing on the street right now. Just kind of give you some background in case you hear about that. So first of all, this looks very simple, doesn't it? You stabilize the patient, you get a history, you initiate treatment, and I'm just going to give you the very bare essentials of that and what we do in the ED. A lot of times you're sitting there going, what did this guy take? If you don't have a history of what's going on, you're using your physical exam and your vital signs and any kind of screening that you can do to try and figure that out. But a lot of times you're still sitting there going, where do I start with this patient? So similar to trauma, similar to advanced cardiac life support, there are some basics that you do on every single patient. And by knowing that, you don't miss things. And it's, this is no different in toxicology too. I'm just going to stroll around and I hope that's not going to bother anybody. I know that there's a light up there, but I sort of like to do this. You start with the ABCs. And I add D for decontamination and A for antidotes. And if you do that, then you usually don't miss anything on a toxicology patient. The airway, breathing, and circulation sound similar, but you have to know a little pharmacology with that. Most of these patients who come in the emergency department who have altered mental status like this don't, aren't apneic when they come in. And so you're sitting there, I'm sitting there looking at the bedside at them going, you know, their breathing's getting lower and lower. You know, we're just probably going to have to protect their airway. It's not often, as we do in the trauma unit, hey, let's get the airway in so we can start doing everything else. These patients were focusing on the airway. So <laughs> I'm going to get a light right up here. So hopefully it's not going to bother anybody too much because they know they're filming this. Uh, by the way, I'll show you lots of patients here, and all of these patients have consented to allow me to use these in academic performances, so don't feel like I'm doing something that's sort of illegal up here or HIPAA related. And these are all years and years ago, most of them. So airway, first of all. Remember, I don't really care what the blood pressure is of these patients, similar to a trauma patient, if they come in and they have no airway. So if they look like they're going to slow down their breathing, I have to intubate them. And we intubate them fairly early in most situations. And most of these patients are going to take some medications to help us intubate them. Who knows the two main types of medicines, both in the trauma unit and in the emergency department, that we do what's called rapid sequence induction for airways with these patients? What's one of them? So an automate's an example. What do we call that big group of drugs? It's called a sedative, right? And there's one reason why I give a sedative to these people before I innovate them. Does anybody know? It's kind of like common sense, right? It's because of the next drug I'm going to give them, which is called a paralytic. And a paralytic, if I give you succinylcholine or rocuronium, can you still hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Can you still see what I'm doing? Yeah. Can you still feel what I'm going to get ready to do to you? Absolutely. Every sensory input is still there. That's why you give the sedative. Because can you imagine anything worse than sitting there on a bed paralyzed with me instructing a medical student how to hold a laryngoscope? 
that's got to be one of the scariest things in the world. It's like being buried alive. You have no, you're out completely helpless. So you want to make sure you give them a drug so they don't remember what I'm getting ready to tell that medical student. That's what the sedative is all about. Now the difference here with the drug overdoses that I see is they've already taken their sedative. Hopefully, hopefully, I'm not intubating them if they haven't taken enough of a sedative that they're not going to remember what I'm getting ready to do. So we usually skip the sedative and we go straight to a paralytic. And when I use a paralytic on a patient, I don't ever use succinyl choline. And that's because it has certain drug interactions and certain patients like crush victims where you you got to be very careful using it and who knows why. What's the one side effect of succinylcholine that you always got to worry about? If the kidneys are failed, it causes something else to go up that could be a problem with succinylcholine. Potassium, right? If they're hyperkalemic and you give succinylcholine, they can go into some fasciculations before they relax and that can raise your potassium a little bit more. And I've seen a couple of overdoses that start out hyperkalemic, that then get succinylcholine and then arrest five or six minutes later. And whether that had anything to do with the potassium or not, I don't know, but I know that I've got really good alternatives, right? Like rocuronium, that paralyze almost as fast and have no side effects virtually at all. So when I do an overdose patient, I don't even use succinylcholine, I go straight to rocuronium, okay? And I don't even need to use a sedative because they've already taken that. This is actually sort of simpler. So then I get on to breathing. When I get the, and you stop me, because I go a little fast here, because remember I only got a half hour to go through <laughs> all of toxicology with you guys. So you'll see a lot of slides here very quickly. So when I go to, to breathe for a patient who gets intubated, I'll hyperventilate them a little bit. If I see altered mental status, I don't know for certain that this isn't a patient with a head injury too. I mean, I see overdose patients that stumble around and hit their head and have all kinds of problems, subdurals and all kinds of problems going along with them. So I'll hyperventilate them to start with. And then believe it or not, I actually smell their breath. Because there's some poisons that have certain smells that I can recognize by what's on their breath. Anybody know what cyanide is supposed to smell like? Um. Exactly. Cyanide's supposed to smell like almost. Now not everybody can smell that. It's sort of genetically predetermined who can and who can't. But if you can smell, uh, smell almonds, that may be cyanide causing their altered mental status. Isopropyl alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, smells like diabetic ketoacidosis because it's converted to acetone in their bodies and they breathe that out just like somebody with DKA. So you can smell that fruity acetone-like smell. Organophosphate pesticides smell like garlic. So different poisons smell different ways and I'll actually smell their breath after I get them innovated. Then I can turn around and look at the monitor. This is like the first time. Before this, I've only cared about their airway. But now I turn around and a lot of patients will be hypotensive. In every overdose patient, in fact, in almost every medical patient that comes in, the treatment of hypotension is always the same. And what do you start with? IV fluids. Everybody gets IV fluids. Two liters of normal saline. And everybody who comes in that's hypotensive, no matter what drug it is. And then there's a couple of choices I can go to after that, because some people will still be hypotensive. They're the standard vasopressors like dopamine and norepinephrine. And in overdose patients, because of the pharmacology of them, almost always I start with norepinephrine, levofed. Levofed, remember, doesn't have any beta-2 adrenergic effects on the blood vessels. So it's not going to vasodilate. It just causes the heart to beat with better contractility. And it stimulates the alpha receptors on blood vessels that vasoconstrict. That's exactly what I want for my overdose patients. So I almost always skip dopamine and go to norepinephrine. Then there are drugs that I would almost call specific vasopressors. And there's really only about three that you need to know about if you deal with these people up in the trauma unit or anywhere else. The first is sodium bicarbonate. Anybody have any idea what sodium bicarbonate is an antidote or raise the blood pressure for? Well, believe it or not, it's any drug that does what we call blocking sodium channels. Lidocaine does that. That's the way lidocaine works, for instance. Or quinidine or procainamide. Some of the drugs you used to use a long time ago before better drugs came about that, we're, that we use right now. But almost all the antidepressants that affect your heart block sodium channels. So sodium bicarbonate will raise the blood pressure on those and actually improve the way they conduct impulses around the heart. So you want to get their pH back up to normal with that. Any drug that blocks sodium channels. I'm sure you've probably never seen that work before. But, <laughs> but this is pretty amazing. This was a, a guy that had overdosed on imipramine. Anybody ever heard of imipramine? 
It's also called Tofrenil. It's an old antidepressant, uh, tricyclic antidepressant. It worked pretty well, but it had a lot of cardiotoxicity. And I was so scared when I saw this patient, because I was a fellow at the time, that as I'm unloading the sodium bicarb, the first needle went right through my hand. The second needle, I fortunately got into the patient. And after the second amp of bicarb got into the patient, he was back into a more normal sinus rhythm. And it can be that fast. It's almost like naloxone for the heart to a certain extent in sodium channel blocking drug poisonings. The second major vasopressor that's almost like an antidote is glucagon. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to use this or not, but glucagon specifically we use for beta blocker poisonings or toxicity or sometimes for calcium channel blocker poisonings. And how it works is a little confusing and we're not sure, but we think it bypasses the beta receptors and stimulates the heart muscle to contract. For whatever reason you, it works, it does, and you gotta give a really big dose. Anybody remember how big of a dose you give glucagon to somebody who's hypoglycemic? About a half a milligram, maybe one milligram. We're giving up to five milligrams in these overdoses to make them better. And a lot of times it works very well. Bypasses the beta-1 receptor on the heart and causes it to beat better. And the dose is actually quite big. And then the last is calcium. You just heard about calcium with Dr. Coimbra telling you, remember when people have a lot of blood transfusions to think about calcium. We're using this for calcium channel blocker overdoses in big doses of calcium. It used to be that we tried a gram or two grams. Well, how about this question? Does any, we've got two different types of calcium you can give somebody in the ICU. What kind are those? Chloride. Calcium chloride and calcium gluconate. What's the difference between those two? Well, we use them every day, right? It's got to be something. If you look at the, the bottle and pull it out, they're both labeled as a gram. What does that mean? Sometimes, I, I mean, I don't even think about this. A resin stone know the answer to this question. So when you think about it, the gluconate molecule on the calcium gluconate is a much bigger molecule than the chloride molecule on the calcium chloride. So gram per gram, you're getting more calcium from the calcium chloride than you are the calcium gluconate. In fact, for a one gram vial, you get three times as much calcium with the chloride. That's why your protocols probably say that you have to give calcium chloride through a central vein or through a very large catheter because it's so much calcium in it, you'll rip up a small peripheral vein with that. That's the difference between those two. So when I get somebody who's got a calcium channel blocker overdose, I'm given calcium chloride, I'm given a lot of it, like five or six grams. I give it until I get calcium in those calcium channel blocker overdoses over 15. I want to make them hyper, hypercalcemic, and then they start to have heartbeat again, okay? Any questions about those drugs? Some of them are stuff we use all the time, but these are all different indications. These are drug overdoses we're doing. But stop me, because I know I'm going a little fast here, but I'm trying to get us back on schedule. So you probably don't do a lot of decontamination of somebody who comes in when they come up in the ED or from trauma unit. And that's a good, I good idea because there's not a lot that makes much difference anymore. When I first started in my residency about 20 years ago, everybody was getting gastric lavage and people were still going home with Epicac when they had their babies. You can't find that stuff anymore because most of it's been found not to do anything. I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute. If I'm going to do any decontamination, this is what I'm trying to do right here. Above all, you want to improve outcome. It's kind of like the procedures that Dr. Coimbra was telling you about. We can do a lot of stuff to people, but if people aren't living and doing better with them, there's a lot of side effects associated with them too, and you always have a cost and benefit that you're dealing with here. So I only want to do these if I'm improving outcome with what we do. And there's lots of choices that I used to have and still do. By and large, the first two, emesis and lavage, we don't really do anymore. We don't do anymore. But we still, at occasion, give them activated charcoal and whole bowel irrigation. I'll just briefly tell you a little bit about that. Does anybody remember this thing? Yeah, yeah this is not an NG tube. This is not your standard NG tube that we put down all the time. This thing's about the size of a garden hose, right? It's called an E-wall tube. Lots of fun things that you can do with this puppy. It's one of the scariest things you can ever do to a patient because most of the time they're still awake when you do it to them. I've worked in hospitals before where it was against hospital policy to put these through the nose. And you guys know why? You're ripping all kinds of turbinates out when you pull this thing back out again. It's miserable. Just imagine putting it through the mouth, though. You almost have to knock somebody out to do that. But the biggest problem with this is actually, if you can see down here, even though it's a big honking tube, big pills still don't fit in these holes. 
So you're still limited to what you can do. If the patient's overdosed on some sort of a corrosive or caustic agent, you just have to put a little NG tube down because it's a liquid. You can suck it right back out again. So the indication for these major overdoses using this guy right here are very limited now. There are some drugs that I can tell you that if you overdose on, you're going to die. There's no antidote. There's no way for me to get it out. And if it's one of my children that does that, I'm going to put one of these tubes down. And I'll give you a good example. You guys ever use colchicine? You've probably heard of colchicine that we use for gout. One of the most toxic drugs that you can possibly take an overdose. I mean, if you get it in, you're all, I can almost call a priest to your bedside because in two days you're going to die. And it's not a quick poison either. It's not like cyanide. So if somebody took colchicine, I'd probably consider putting one of these things down just to get as many fragments, as much stuff as I could get out because I knew that's my only chance. But it's so limited that we do that anymore. There's really not almost any indication to do it. But fortunately, if I want to torture my patients, I've still got lots of different ways I can do that. And the first is activated charcoal. I would hesitate to guess that you probably almost have never used that in the ICU, probably for a good reason. So this is the, ex have you used it before? You guys had a chance? In the old days. <laughs> Clark's going back to the old days here. Um, so this stuff is just like the stuff you grill on. It's that kind of charcoal mixed in water, but it's been heated and pressurized. And if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like Swiss cheese. And that's to allow the drugs to kind of get lost in that. And then they just flow through the GI tract and never get absorbed into the body. Almost everything could be bound by activated charcoal. There's only a couple things that are not. Alcohols are not. Otherwise, you know what I'd be doing to every alcoholic that comes in the emergency department. <laughs> And this doesn't bind it, so unfortunately I can't do that. But almost every drug is bound at least a little bit by activated charcoal. And if you wanted to give it to them and they were compliant and they would drink it, then you could bind up some of the drug and keep it from getting in there. But we just don't have an opportunity to do that anymore because I've got no study that shows this makes a difference in outcome either. And then there's all of our favorites. <laughs> Go lightly. I bet you there's people besides me in here who've had their, their 50th year old <laughs> colonoscopy. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know what this tastes like, if that's the case. I actually thought, this is a piece of cake, you know? You want one glass every 10 minutes. It's got a nice little taste to it. You probably know, if you are like me, that there's a slight thicker consistency to this than water. And there's something about that on about the third glass that makes you start to gag. <laughs> there are some main indications for doing whole bowel irrigation, what we call whole bowel irrigation, which means pushing these drugs through the GI tract before they can be absorbed into the body. There's only about three that I can tell you about, but they're very important because this still may save somebody's life. One are sustained release drugs. Lots of antihypertensive now are sustained release. There's anticonvulsants that are sustained release. There's antidepressants. And if that stuff gets into your stomach and your intestines, it's going to sit there and be absorbed for hours. I've got an opportunity to get it out. Rapamil will kill you if you take too much of it. So I'm going to try and push it out before it can get all the way into your, in, through your GI tract. Then there are people who take metals that aren't bound by activated charcoal like iron or lithium. Again, it's not bound by charcoal. It sits in the GI tract for long periods of time. These, believe it or not, are iron pills that a lady took in an overdose. You can see them on your flat plate. So we started giving a bunch of go lightly, and you could actually follow them going through the GI tract into the colon. And once they get into the colon, I don't really care about them. They don't have to get all the way out because very few drugs are absorbed very well in the colon. And then the last, which you may see from time to time, are with people we call body packers or body stuffers. There's a difference between those two. This person right here is a body packer. They've actually gone down into Mexico or Colombia or some South American country, and they've actually taken uh, latex glove tips or condoms and filled them up with heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine, and then they swallow them and they keep them in their GI tract until they get into the country. Then they give themselves a laxative, get them all out, and then sell the drugs. If one of these packets opens up on the airplane, they're dead. They're pretty much dead. So if they start to leak a little bit and they start to get very nervous about it, they may admit that they've done it and they get brought in the emergency department and I got to do, figure out what to do this. And I may have, to, may have to have Dr. Coimbra come in to try and open these people up to get all these drug packets out or else they could easily die very quickly. Body stuffers, on the other hand, are people that are walking around down in the gas lamp district and a little nervous and the police start chasing them and they stuff the evidence before they can get arrested. 
they usually get nervous too and finally admit it, so they get brought into the emergency department and I have to give them go lightly to try and get it out. And who hates me the most in that situation? <laughs> the nurses in ED, because they got to get back and forth a patient up to this thing right here. And if they're under arrest, we'll usually just handcuff them to this railing right here, this toilet, because they usually won't escape if they're handcuffed to the toilet. <laughs> So the bottom line about decontamination and the reason I don't spend a whole lot of time on it anymore is because very little of it makes a difference in outcome. So the only ones I'm doing are those ones with major potential fatal overdoses. And that's about it. Any questions about that? Very quickly, is there a physical exam that you can do for a poison patient? Absolutely. There's two things that get confused all the time and you guys will see this in the trauma unit. Um, the to two toxic syndromes, you're looking for all this stuff here, but these two, anticholinergic and adrenergic or sympathomimetic, are two very common syndromes we see in this hospital and they can be mixed up very easily. So sympathomimetic patients under the influence of drugs like, well, tell me what is an adrenergic agent, a stimulant that somebody could come in with. What's an example? Methamphetamine. Yeah, besides meth, that's a great answer because that's about all we see here. What else could do that though? Cocaine, PCP, and even LSD can do that. And some of these newer amphetamines that I'll tell you about as we go along here, they all look the same. They come in very violent, very paranoid. Nobody wants to take care of these people. They're cursing at you. They're taking a swing at you. They may be scratching you. You want these people nothing to do with them except have them handcuffed to the gurney. They come in with lots of handcuffs, sometimes around their feet, around their hands, lots of chains, people blaring guns at you. That was methamphetamine. Now this is cocaine, but it looks identical. It's that caged animal appearance with the big pupils and the very dry mouth. And this guy came in telling me that somebody was gonna shoot him in the emergency department, which could have happened, but fortunately did not. <laughs> and fortunately in our ED or the trauma unit has not happened to my knowledge, at least since Dr. Coimbra and I have been here. But this guy looks scared and they usually are. They're very paranoid. This cocaine looks identical. PCP also looks identical. Notice. If they come in and they've got army boots on and they're clearly not in the military, that a lot of times is sympathomimetic poisoning, okay? They start to sort of have this appearance that looks alike. If you see somebody coming in in the hog tie position, that's almost always sympathomimetic poisoning in our emergency department. Again, this is PCP, they look identical. And then here's crystal methamphetamine again. Another telltale sign is the heavy metal t-shirt, <laughs> commonly associated with sympathomimetic poisoning. But you can see again, lots of handcuffs, lots of restraints. These patients are almost always on the influence of a stimulant. See the similarities? Here's the heavy metal t-shirt, the big pupils and dry mouth, and the hog tie position. This is a fascinating case. This guy, now Dr. Coimber remembers this like I do probably, but we were, um, years ago, there were groupies that used to follow a band all around the country. And at that group, every, what everybody would do would be to drop acid. And then, you guys know what acid is? LSD? And then they would go to these concerts and they would follow them all around the country. What band did they follow? Grateful. The Grateful Dead, very good. So this was at a Grateful Dead concert and this guy was actually a very intelligent computer programmer for IBM, but he was also a deadhead. And so he'd follow the group around, he dropped a little LSD and had what's called a bad trip on LSD. <laughs> and for some reason thought he could take on six policemen at the same time and lost as you can see, by all the scratches and stuff. His CPK with rhabdomyolysis the next day peaked out at 250,000. And he, he begged me to show his picture to people because he was so unhappy about what had happened and been so sad. Anyway, that's sympathomimetic poisoning. Now contrast that with Nightmare on Elm Street here, right? This is about as close as I've ever been to Freddy Krueger in my life, but the same big pupils the same dry mouth, this is charcoal by the way. He's got the chains and stuff and you'd think all the world that this guy probably killed somebody in his life. He didn't. But he's under the influence of drug that makes him look like this with very big pupils. <laughs> this guy overdosed on Benadryl and he is anti-cholinergic but peripherally looking at him from across the room looks identical and they get mixed up all the time. But if I get really close to this guy, even though he's probably really violent in his natural state, he's actually very passive. And if I get really down on him, he's, he's like picking at stuff that's not there and looking at flies flying around that aren't there. 
He's what I would call passively psychotic. He's not violent at all. These patients are just confused. So or antipsychotic medicines can do this. Benadryl can do that. Um, a lot of uh, overnight sleeping medicines can do that. And they can look vital sign wise and physical exam wise just like the stimulant medicines. Just confused. They're usually not violent. They just need usually soft restraints. We see them with altered mental status upstairs in the unit all the time. The, uh, the medicine service misdiagnoses this all the time too. So they always ask me to come up and try and make the difference out here. So that's physical exam. Now I'm moving fast and I apologize. Very quickly, the only things you need to know are two things about toxicology screening of patients. When I first got here, I think this was before Dr. Coimbra got here, they were doing blood toxicology analysis on every trauma patient that came in. We stopped that fairly quickly because there's not very much utility to it. These blood toxicology tests, random blood tests, would come back about three days later and you know patients have either signed out AMA or they're dead by that time, most of them, or they've gone home. So the utility of it was almost nothing. So we stopped that because there's only a few things that on blood make a difference. I will get on all my altered mental status and acetaminophen level because if I miss that, then they might have to give a liver transplant in a week. And sometimes I'll get a blood alcohol because that helps me with their altered mental status. Almost nothing else makes a difference when they come in. Urine screening is a little different. We, as you probably know, send lots of rapid bedside urine tox tests. And I'll get about six or seven different drugs. All that tells me is that sometime in the last three days, that person says taken that drug that they test positive for. Doesn't tell me how much, it doesn't tell me when, it doesn't even tell me whether they're under the influence or not at that time. It just tells me they've taken it. The utility of that is much less than what you'd think for the number of times we send those tests to the lab. Okay? You can send a comprehensive urine tox test that'll give me probably 50 to 100 drugs, again come back three days later, but if these, they're still comatose in the unit at that point, then that might give you an answer to why. Okay, that's about all you need to know about tox testing. Any questions about blood or urine toxicology screens? Now, for the last, what do I have, like five minutes? I'm gonna tell you about new drugs of abuse. And you stop me anytime you need to stop, okay? Otherwise, you know, I can ramble and you can tell. You guys have heard of GHB? Yeah. Maybe some of you have tried GHB. <laughs> I'm a little too scared to, but you can find it all down in the gas lamp if you wanna go party. So GHB goes by lots of different street names, some of which you'll hear your patients talking about. Liquid X, some of my favorites like Easy Lay, not sure where that comes from. Sometimes people mix up the lettering of it, but you'll hear lots of different street names to it. It works fairly rapidly. Now imagine this. You're going down in the gas lamp, you're going out to Cafe Sevilla, and you're gonna do a little dancing. Imagine a better drug that you can start swigging before you get in. You can be drunk during that time for three, three hours or so, and then when you're ready to drive home, it's all gone. That's what this is supposed to be like. A wrap it on and wrap it off high. Very similar to alcohol. <laughs> yeah, you should go try it if you haven't tried it. Now, if you look on the internet, this is what they tell you about GHB. A lot like alcohol, if you start going into medium doses, you can actually get an appreciation for music. Supposedly, according to the internet, it increases sexual effects, pros maybe increases erectile capacity. You can find that on the internet. I find that hard to believe, but maybe. And then if you get into heavy doses, you actually really start getting some good feelings here. But what they don't say on the internet is that if you use more than the recommended dose, it can lead to nausea, vomiting, and really comatose and apnea. And that's the big problem with this. And the main time we see GHB as a problem coming in is when they mix it with alcohol, which has an additive effect and makes people stop breathing. This is what you see in the newspapers from GHB. And this is what I see in the emergency department. These people literally, the lights off, they're comatose with a tube in place and they'll sit smack up in the bed, yank the tube out and walk out of the emergency department. It's like the light comes right back on again. But you gotta get past that apneic stage and survive it first. So you see seizures every once in a while. The duration is actually quite short and most of the time you will not see this person because they're not under the influence by the time they get upstairs. It comes in a lots of different preparations, some of which you used to be able to get and still could in head shops now, like Blue Nitro, this Renutrient we found on one patient one time, and right now there is no antidote and it's just supportive care, GHB. This girl came from a very 
highly thought of establishment where women don't wear many clothes in San Diego, down in Point Loma. And <laughs> she was a dancer there. And she w went unconscious and got brought into the emergency department. And I found out later that she got very upset because she woke up and pulled the tube out that she had done what she told all of her female dance friends not to do, which is to mix alcohol and GHB. That she used to take before she danced because she said it made her dance better. Joyous music. She taught me about another little trick that they're doing out there. You guys ever heard of a hammerhead? Yeah? Or, or trail mix? So. <laughs> they sound good, don't they? Don't you want to know? You, you're as old-fashioned as I am. So now in the clubs downtown, if you want to go out and dance all night long, because a lot of these clubs are open all night, they usually take something like ecstasy. You guys know what ecstasy is? So ecstasy is a form of methamphetamine now that lots of kids get. In fact, they estimate that about 30% of all graduating high school seniors have tried ecstasy, if you can imagine that. That makes me feel really good, real good with three in high school right now. But anyway, this girl told me that they'll go to these clubs, they'll take ecstasy, and now what's the problem if you meet somebody and you're a guy and you've been doing ecstasy and you've been dancing all night long and you meet somebody and want to take her home? You can't get an erection, right? You've got this sympathomimetic on board, like ecstasy, and they can't get an erection very well. So what would you think they would take, coupled with their ecstasy, that helps them out? It's not GHB. Yeah. Viagra. Viagra. So they'll, the, the, the hammerhead is taking a combination of ecstasy and Viagra and then going out to party. And that's what they're all doing out there on the streets right now. Have you guys given ketamine in the unit? Do you give ketamine? You've probably seen it before. If you've seen it, the effect that it has on your patients, it's only a matter of time you figure before somebody gets this on the street, right? I don't know who would like it, but you know there's somebody out there who's probably going to like it. It is now. It's on the street. There's articles in the Union Tribune like this about it being smuggled across the border. You can go across the border right now and say, you know, this is an animal tranquilizer and I've got a horse farm in San Diego and I kind of need some stuff to put my horses out. And the pharmacist will pull this big bucket of ketamine from up underneath uh, the counter out. And you can buy all you want, bring it back and sell it because some people like it it causes you to feel sort of spaced out, as you know, as our patients do. It goes by street names like Super K or Vitamin K. If you hear anybody talking about that, they're talking about using ketamine. And it works to our anesthetics. In fact, it is. That's why it's been used. Now, the problem with ketamine is that not a lot of people like to inject stuff into them. I mean, that just doesn't have the aesthetic appeal as smoking or snorting or taking a pill. It's a little harder to do. You got to get a needle for God's sakes. So the internet is full of different ways that you can use ketamine now so that you don't have to inject yourself. I mean, you can see if you're really serious about this, mix it up in a rectal lubricant and shoot it up there because there's lots of absorption through the rectal mucosa. That's why suppositories work so well. So people are doing it that way. But the biggest way they're doing it now, the most important, is to insufflate it or snort it. And they're taking ketamine and they're actually snorting it in both noses and they're using doses that are a lot lower than what we use to knock somebody out. Because they're just trying to get high, remember? And they're looking for something they call the K-hole. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? That's, I read about this stuff. I'm not exactly doing it to find it, but they call it the K-hole, and that's where they're trying to get this dissociative effect without being knocked out. Our own Department of Psychiatry here have actually published articles about ketamine as a preferred substance of abuse. So it's there, low level, whether you know it or not in the society right now. And there's not a lot of people, this is what they describe about it, there's not a lot of other uses for it on the street except for people to get high. I've had people tell me that they want to go through withdrawal from heroin and they'll use ketamine to sort of mellow them out through the heroin withdrawal. So there may be ways that they're using it out there that are working. Not much you can do about it except let it wear off. It's fairly short acting as you know. Next toxin. What could we possibly say about Robitussin? I mean, you guys probably have all used Robitussin at one point in your life. Well, it's got a drug called dextromethorphan. This is the major cough suppressant in Robitussin. And, it, and interestingly, it also works at the same receptors that ketamine does, if you take enough of it. And that's the whole problem here. It goes on the street by Dex or DXM. Sometimes if you hear that, that's what they're using. Lots of high school kids are using dextromethorphan now in excessive doses. And it gives you dissociation, just like ketamine does. You just got to get enough of it. What's enough 
of dextromethorphan. Well, usually a starting dose is at least a whole bottle of Robitussin that you've got to drink. And you can imagine that's hard to stomach. We'll come back to that in a minute. But if you really want to get a full-blown hallucination, you've got to drink about a six-pack of Robitussin in order to get that much. Now, there are pills out there called Coracidin that are pure dextromethorphan. And people will take, a lot of the kids will take those instead of trying to get this stuff. But this you can walk into the pharmacy and get. The pills are a little more difficult. But this is what they describe. And you want to know why people would use it? Look at this. So one bottle gets you what's called the robo walk, a drippy feeling. This is all from the internet now. If you really want to get up to about a six pack, you can actually get alien encounters with this stuff. <laughs> why not, right? Out of body experiences. So the entire internet about dextromethorphan is designed to tell you how to drink that much without vomiting. And there's ways that you can extract the dextromethorphan out of it. And again, if you're a teenager, this is very simple. You can probably get all the materials and do this at home if you really want to. Just hope my kids aren't doing it. I've seen this fellow numerous times in the emergency department because he comes in with a CVS bag full of Robitussin bottles. Police usually bring him in. He's got handcuff marks from battling them. They usually have to tase him a couple times before he comes in. He's just spaced out on dextromethorphan and just that's his drug of abuse. Not much you can do about this, this either. There's no antidote. You just pretty much have to let it wear off and sedate him if you have to. Now, anybody have high school kids? This frightens me. Every time I go to children's and see patients there, I have to sit down at the bedside with these teenagers and really get deeply into why they overdosed on medicines because I want to make sure I'm not doing the same thing with my kids. <laughs> Nothing scarier, is it, than hearing troubled teenagers with this kind of stuff? This is the latest craze I'm told about, though. They do what's called grazing. They'll all go out and they'll have a big party on Saturday night, and everybody's supposed to bring three or four pills from the parents' medicine cabinet. Doesn't matter what it is. Just bring them and we're going to put them all in this big salad bowl, mix them all up and everybody starts to eat them to see what kind of effects they can have. They're actually doing this out there. And so they start getting into really interesting things. Have you guys heard of Wellbutrin or Bupropion abuse? Probably the most abused drug now in this community besides methamphetamine, the most abused legal drug, maybe as much as oxycodone, as much as Percocet. This, if you look on the internet though, it releases catecholamines like norepinephrine, that's exactly what methamphetamine does. And that's probably why people are starting to get these really interesting co sort of complaints with this and findings. Um, abuse has been around for at least a decade, if not more. And they're cutting these babies up and snorting them as well, or taking extra pills of them. Anybody know the main side effect if you take too much of this? Seizures. 30 to 40% of people that overdose on this will have a convulsion and they come in. So we see it all the time. But if you go on the internet, you can find all kinds of articles about abuse of Wellbutrin. From the New England Journal of Medicine, seizures induced by insufflation, snorting bupropion or Wellbutrin. Very common in our society right now. Seizures occur in a lot of people, self-limited, usually don't need to be treated. But if we see a young person with a seizure, unknown etiology, we're thinking, are they using Wellbutrin now? Next drug of abuse, believe it or not, Seroquel. Now, this, <laughs> I don't work in the jail anymore, but a lot of my partners do in the emergency department. And this, this drug is prescribed like water in the jail. It's actually a pretty decent antipsychotic because it has so few side effects. I used to say, with the patient population I see in the ED at Hillcrest, if I could put Haldol in the water fountain at Hillcrest, I would do that. <laughs> Probably for some of the staff there too, to tell you the truth. If it wasn't for neuroleptic malignant syndrome and dystonias, I'd give it to everybody. <laughs> this, you probably could give to everybody because it doesn't have those same side effects. So lots of people take it. But not surprisingly, for a drug that's so safe now with so many people taking it, some people actually like it. And in the jail, they'll start to ask for it. You know, I have this psychotic disorder um, before I got into the jail. And so they'll come in and they'll ask for it. And they'll, yeah, well, sure, whatever, we'll put them on it. And they get high if they take a little extra Seroquel. Overly used for insomnia, lots of people will take this in society now for insomnia, but it, uh, cases and reports of abuse are actually becoming more and more common now. And, and a lot of times you'll see people say they're on ketiapine or Seroquel and they really aren't. They just sort of like the way they feel with it. Mild hallucinogenic high. 
the, the common practice now is they'll grind it up and they'll shoot it with heroin because they like the difference of effects they get by combining heroin and Seroquel. So you may see that too up in the unit to a certain extent. <laughs> Called the cue ball, intranasal catiopine abuse. Not much you can do with them either. All right, who's heard of spice? Yeah, you probably can't not read the paper and hear about spice, right? Anybody know what spice is? Or K2? K2 is the same thing if you hear that. Anybody know what that is? No, we're coming to bath salts though. It is. It's synthetic marijuana. There, there's a whole group of chemicals. Two minutes. I'm almost done. There's a whole group of chemicals. She didn't say that to Dr. Coimbra, notice. She just said it to me. There's a whole group of chemicals. But that, I understand. I get the message. That, <laughs> that I'm just kidding that are synthetic chemicals that stimulate the same receptors as marijuana, except they're about 100 times more potent than marijuana. And the way you do this is they don't grow in a plant, but they're a liquid that you spray on whatever you're smoking, and then you get it into the body that way. And it can cause all kinds of weird stuff. Some people say they feel really good with it. You don't have to smoke as much as you do with marijuana. But if you smoke too much, they get psychotic reactions, and they get bad nausea and vomiting, almost paradoxical of what you'd think with marijuana. And they get seizures, and they go crazy. So if you hear people talking about spice or K2, that's synthetic marijuana. And then lastly is bath salts. And that's been in the, in the media a whole lot recently. Do you guys remember the guy that supposedly bit the guy's face off in Florida? That's supposed to be bath salts. Who knows what bath salts is? Anybody? Synthetic, it's another type of methamphetamine. This is nothing but a different type of methamphetamine that people are doing now. And the reason that it's sort of legal is because all you have to do is take the methamphetamine molecule and change a couple of chemical side chains and all of a sudden it's a new chemical. And that's legal by the Food and Drug Administration. And then the DEA has to catch up to it and make these illegal eventually one at a time. But for a while, they're legal. And there's lots of ones that are in um, production right now that go by different names. But MDPV is one of the most common ones. The reason that people have weird reactions to it, we think, is because they're not used to the dose. It's very potent. And so they're probably taking too much compared to what they normally do with methamphetamine. And they have weird reactions. They can have convulsions and, again, psychosis. And um, there's not a whole lot of ways that you can treat that except sedatum. They can use it by any way, smoke it or snort it or take pills of it. And it all does the same thing. It goes by lots of different names. They're not true bath salts. But the name comes from the fact that they're crystals that look like crystal bath salts. Okay? And they'll even disguise it by saying, not for human consumption on it. They know that they're going to use it anyway. Ivory, Wave, all these different things. These are all bath salts products. You can get them at head shops all over San Diego, probably still. So we just sedate them, and they usually do OK. So the bottom line about poisonings is time is my friend. If I can keep these people alive, they'll eventually metabolize their drugs and go back to whatever their baseline state is, whether that's good or bad. Time is the key here. Observe, observe them and good supportive care, which is what you guys are going to do up in the unit. And then lastly, remember, it's never good to test positive for Coke, especially if you work for Pepsi. <laughs> Any questions? OK, thank you.